but I have the duty to protect and to ensure the education of my child. The latter is not a responsibility that I take lightly, nor one that I would ever entrust to those who have no direct or vested interest in my child's well-being or who have agendas that run counter to ensuring that my son reaches his full potential. I actively parent and I raise my child to be passionate about his education. I require that he have his eyes, ears, and mind open and ready to receive the knowledge that will lead to his intellectual growth, development, and ultimately his freedom. I partner with schools to assist me to that end, particularly given that they appropriate my tax dollars for that purpose. Just as I do with my son, I hold educators to a very high standard of performance. As a result, I have a very high performing 8th grade honor student who is academically advanced. In school, he was in the Gifted Talented Program, the National Junior Honor Society, on the All-A Honor Roll, while taking pre-AP in one high school algebra class in the 8th grade. He was also an outstanding student athlete. And do note that I am saying was. <laughs> he has never, in his eight years in school to date, had a discipline referral. He not only exceeds expectations in the classroom, but on standardized assessments of knowledge as well. Just a few weeks ago, and this is why I repeat it was, on a morning when he should have been tutoring children and his peers in math because he has a way of explaining things better than some of his teachers, I dematriculated him. I took him out of school, away from his teachers, away from his coaches, and away from his peers, much to his consternation. I took him away to protect him, not from bullies, not from predators or pedophiles, but to protect him from the school administrators, to protect him from Leander ISD administrators, and to protect him from you. In the winter of 2014, I first became aware of and concerned, um, alarmed really with a practice that everyone knows exists, but nobody wants to admit to. It's a threat to my child's continued academic progression and success. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the term teaching to the test. And I'm just going to kind of wing it from here because standing here before you, it's really frustrating seeing how far away, how disconnected you all are from what actually happens from your policies. That not only impact my child, but that impact thousands of children in this state. My very bright honor student is being homeschooled until I can get him into a, a school in a few weeks. Because this time last year, may I continue? It began with his advanced placement math teacher who decided she could no longer advance the peaks. She had to give the kids practice star assessment every day for months, months ahead of the star assessments. Now, we all know that star assessments at the end of March, beginning of April. In December, she started giving the kids practice star assessments in lieu of actual education. After a few days of this, I addressed it with her. She was afraid of losing her job or it impacting her career. So after a few weeks, I addressed it with the principal. And he asked me to be patient while he worked through, because after all, the teachers were concerned with their careers and this was all new to a lot of the teachers and you know, uh, standardized assessments, they, especially here in Texas, they, you know, they're very powerful and everybody, but everybody has to perform well. And after a few months, well, after a few weeks after that, I attempted to address it with Leander ISD. They pointed the finger at you. It's not our fault. It's yours. And so I reached out to TEA and a lot of you. I was ignored. That's not surprising. When I finally got someone in the Department of Student Assessment, they pointed the finger back at Land or ISD. And so I did what any parent would do, any parent worth her salt would do. I took action to protect my child, his education, because that is paramount to me. And I refused the star assessment. Not because he may have failed. As a matter of fact, I should have brought a copy for you to see. He excelled at standardized assessments. He likes to take them, just as I did when I was a child. I refused not because he may have failed, he 
doesn't have testing anxiety. He, he in no way would have been unhappy to take the assessment. I refuse because this peculiar institution that you have here in Texas, the STAR assessment, replaces true education. You may want to say, what a horrible school, or why were these teachers doing this? But it was your policies that directed them. Your policies. And do you know that policy is transmitted via the Texas Association of School Boards? There's a little flyer, a, a, a primer, that your director, TEA's director of, of student assessment, sends out to schools who have problem parents like myself, who have outstanding students. We're not compliant enough. We won't allow you to hijack our children's education. So they send around this primer telling them how to punish us to make sure we don't do it again. They just score the answer documents in zero. And in the greater scheme of things, I suppose that's really not a big deal, as again, my kid is an honor student. But when I dematriculated him and I wanted to enroll him in a private school that actually values education, they said, oh, well, according to the STAR assessment, he can't read, write, and arithmetic. <laughs> He's been fluently reading since he was four years old. He's been doing mathematical computations since he was three years old. And because he didn't take an assessment, he didn't touch it, he didn't see it, because, not because he refused, because I refused, because of your policies, his school refused to educate him. Your policies. And as a parent, I did everything. I reached out to the teacher, I reached out to the administration, I reached out to the school district, and I reached out to you. And you all ignored me. You ignored every other parent who tried to tell you what was going on. And now, the result is that my bright honor student sits at home while you sit here talking about accountability. At the beginning, you talked about being thankful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Rowley. No, stay up there, because I think that yeah, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to, to respond. And forgive me, I'm not able to speak into my microphone and, and look at you. I'll do the best I can. Um, first, let me say that, that uh, as a board member, I hear your, uh, your pain. I hear your frustration. Um, and and I, uh, I think that it's a, um, a sad state of affairs when an honor student like your child is taken out of the Texas public school system. And I respect your decision to do so. I'm sorry that it came to the point that you felt like that was the only action that you can take. Um, but with regard to the State Board of Education, one um, role that we play is to allow uh, members of the public like yourself to come and to voice your position and your frustration uh, and, and to allow you to bring to the forefront what I consider to be a very important issue, which is the overemphasis of standardized testing in our public school system. I think that's what you're speaking to. But in defense of myself and my colleagues, we, we are not the implementers, the administrators, the originators of the STAR exam system. In fact, we have one person who's sitting on a board of 15, a commission of 15, to look at accountability. And so we're going to have one voice out of 15 as to whether or not standardized tests continue to play a major role in accountability going forward. But we had absolutely nothing to do, and I can guarantee you I never voted, and neither did any of my colleagues by, by law, never voted on the implementation of the STAR exam, or the tax exam, or the TOS exam, or any other exam that's being administered in Texas public schools. What we do, essentially, is we review textbooks and we decide on the standards that are going to be tested. But we do not have any authority or jurisdiction or um, power to, to address whether or not what the role that standardized tests play. I know my response sounds like, to a frustrated parent, that we're passing the buck or pointing the finger or whatever. But all I'm simply trying to do is to tell you that I 
I uh, commiserate very much with your feelings. It uh, saddens me that we get to the point in our education system that, that, teacher, or, or that parents like you feel like you have to take a, a, a student like your child out of the system. But our hands are tied in that regard. I hope that a transcript of your, of your talk, which was very compelling, could be given to the legislature because that's where it begins. That's where STAR, tax, cost, all the testing regimen, all of that begins in the legislature, and it's imposed upon the Texas Education Agency to implement it, and not us. So I hope you hear the tenor of my, of my remarks, which is I'm, I'm very sorry that you're at this position. I'm sorry that, the, that, that our public school system um, has found itself in this predicament. And I hope that those who have the power to do something about it hear what you have to say. And so I, I just want to thank you for being here. Mr. Rattler. I, I echo the comments of my colleagues, and, and thank you for coming, and thank you for being an advocate for your child. Um, my wife is a high school Spanish teacher, and I have a son who's a junior in his public school today. Um, and so we walk this journey with you every day. We, we see it. Uh, we feel it. And um, I don't know if you heard my comments to our colleague that does have that seat on the commission. If we want well-rounded kids, we need a well-rounded accountability system. And there are things that colleges, employers, and the general public tell us are important that have nothing to do with a bubble sheet. And so it is, and, and the change has started, you know, last session they changed it from 15 to 5. Um, but I, I still believe deeply that the problem isn't the test, it's the stakes riding on the test. Nobody opposes their kids or objects to their kids being tested to make sure they're learning. We all support that. What the problem I've got, and that most, if not all, of the parents and teachers I talk to and students, we don't mind being tested. We just want the state of Texas to say there are other things going on in that school that, are, that matter, that are important. Um, and with House Bill 5 and looking at the different endorsements, they realize that there's not just one way to define a smart kid. Um, and so I think we are getting there. We're not there yet. The accountability system, um, the reason why that teacher is doing those practice tests is because that school district is given an A through F rating based solely on that test. And so any employee in any company in any part of the world, when told by their employer, this is how I'm going to grade whether you keep your job, they're going to spend their time there. I don't, know, I don't care if you're a reservation agent for an airline or a welder for a trailer company. When you're told by your boss, Here's what determines whether you keep your job or not. That's where you're going to spend your time if you want to keep your job. And that's what we're, we've done with Texas teachers is if your kids don't do well in the test, your job is in jeopardy. And it's, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, now, I will say one of the things that this board has recognized, we do have a role to play in the amount of content we are asking teachers and kids to cover in a school year. And this board has unanimously said we understand that, and we want to make sure kids have time to master that content, not merely be taught that content. Because we want them to retain that knowledge to the next year, to the next year, and when they go to college. So I don't think you'll find any better supporters of your message than in this room. Uh, we, we have seen it, and, and just like here, if we get blamed for it, uh, we are the recipients of this system, not the originators of it. So. Count us as advocates for you, and if, you, if there's any way I can help you spread your message, you let me know. Um, actually, uh, the policies that during the summer, I actually submitted public information act requests to get emails that went between um, both my school administrator, my child's school administrators, the Leander ISD administration, and TEA. It is uh, whether I understand the relationship between the start assessments and the legislature, believe you me, I understand. But it is TEA's application of policy that not only goes and get, runs counter to education for children, but it tramples upon parental rights. Right? These are your policies. There is no doubt about this. Now, you may not, not personally be aware, but I can assure you that these are your policies. Well, and, and, and I hear. Let me, let, me make it, let me draw a distinction. There are things that the legislature empowers the agency to do that still don't involve us. And so when you say TEA, there are things that TEA does that we have no authority over whatsoever. We have, as my colleague mentioned, we set the standards, 
we adopt the instructional materials, we approve or not veto charter schools, and we manage the permanent school fund. But anything we're, with regards to testing or accountability, we are passengers on that ship, not the captain. So I, I just ask you to, and, and I'm happy to, if you want to share with me anything you've received from the agency to show you, we, if we're accountable, we do not want to duck accountability for what we've done or not done. But when you say TEA policies, there are a great many things they do that we have no input or no oversight whatsoever. Well, well, their, well TEA's position is that the State Board of Education has directed them to the Texas Association of School Boards for the policy that requires them to falsify a student's performance record to say that they took an assessment that they did not. That is what TEA says that you are responsible, that you are behind the TASB primer um, that says that, hey, we don't, we don't want any involvement with, with kids not taking the state assessment, so um, let's just pretend that they did. <laughs> we don't want to answer to the state, we don't want to answer to the federal government, we don't want to answer to the parents, so we'll just lie. TEA says it's you. Wait, if you will forward those emails to me, um, you and I can get to the bottom of this and find the answer to it. Uh, my email is really easy. It's thomas at thomasratliff.com. Um, and since you brought up the federal government, I would uh, I forgot to mention, in grades three through eight, the vast majority of the testing in grades three through eight are required from the federal government, not even the state government. So we're even, we're a third class passenger on that boat, not even a second or a first class passenger. So um, I hear you and, and I'm, I'm with you and I have advocated for us to withdraw from No Child Left Behind and give Texas control back of our classrooms instead of the federal government. But unfortunately, the legislature has grown addicted to the money from the federal government, and they're willing to take the strings attached. And I don't think it's a fair trade. I think we ought to give them the money back and take control back. So uh, I'll help you in any way. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mr. Payne. Madam Chairman, and uh, I'll just again uh, echo you and I have had a conversation. And, um, and I, I guess I guess that my concern where I followed up your superintendent, I was very curious I guess I guess my level of concern was is that uh, that that every every parent every stakeholder in the district is entitled to some kind of due process through the grievance uh, through, through the grievance process and that, that it's my understanding that, that there were some issues with that and that in terms of, of, uh, of, of documents uh, mysteriously being lost or going away and, and in spite of you hand delivering those, um, at least that was my understanding of that. And, and so I guess my question to you is: is that uh, uh, has there been any kind of further follow up with the school district in any kind of, in, in terms of addressing your concerns? After I notified the school district that I filed a civil rights complaint with the federal government, they finally agreed to allow me to have a FERPA hearing, and we actually had that hearing last week. We won't have a decision, but. I can assure you, I, I can tell you how it turns out there because of, of the, the way that the state accountability system is managed. They, their position is that they have no way to attach a statement as the federal government, as the federal law um, requires to my son's, to, to the um, STAR assessment results that were attributed to my son. He did not take a STAR assessment last spring. So they're saying, oh, well, we have no way because you know, the next school could pull that from online, for example. So we, we can't attach a statement to that, so oh well. And in the words of my school principal, yeah, it looks like he failed the test. So what? Well, it means a lot to a parent who wants to enroll her child in school. And can't. So, and just, to, just as a follow up, the, um, your, in terms of your, your, your objection to your student taking the STAR, is more to do perhaps with the, the overemphasis of the STAR and, and just sort of feeding that dragon uh, over and over and over again. And, and it, it is more of you kind of making a statement that you're tired of your, your, your children being, your, your child being tested to death over and over and over, and that is supplanting real education. I don't have any objections to STAR assessment. There are parents who have very valid and legitimate objections. I do not object because I don't, my kid does well. I, it, it's not my, you know, my stake in the ground. What I object to is my child last year was in an advanced placement math class. He was in the seventh grade last year. He was taking an eighth grade math class. His math teacher refused to teach math. Instead, she gave them old STAR assessments that she acquired from, I guess they released them at some point. That's, that's what she did in lieu of actual mathematics. And when I asked her
her to stop and approached the principal and said no more. What she did was she cut the top off and said start and gave it to him anyway. <laughs> and she told me that she would try in the weeks after this began in December, she was going to try in the weeks after the star assessment in the spring, the two weeks before summer vacation, to cover some of that material. So that when he went to the eighth grade and took a high school algebra, well, it wouldn't matter that he didn't learn all of these pre-algebraic principles because they were probably just gonna review anyway. Pardon me, but that's ridiculous. And as a parent, I'm not standing for that. None of you should stand for that. No parent in this room should stand for that. You want our input as parents. You want our help. I'm telling you, I want yours. I, we direct our children's education. You partner with us to do that. That is not education. And Madam Chair, just as a follow-up, uh, and, and this is something that happened this past spring, uh, and Vaughn, it's my understanding that the, that the legislature did pass some legislation to limit the amount of time that we spent on assessments uh, and, and those types of things. Is, is that... That um, th that's correct in chapter 39 and there is a provision that limits um, the use of local um, preparatory assessment and, and when, when did that take effect um, that was passed several years ago um, let's see if I, can find it. I think there was this one this last session was there, right? yeah, so the last session the one last session, tried, they had to, um, two different provisions, and they tried to um, align them. Um, so the, the concept wasn't new last session. It was trying to um, make sense of the two differing provisions they had in Chapter 39. Okay. So you're, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, Davis. Uh, so the main objection is that um, is not the assessment at the end. It's that they do all this prep work and constantly right. feeding for months ahead of for months right. ahead That's of time. Education. So it's really kind of a local district policy that is that they got directly from the EA. No, no, not on, not on that. Now the no, EA yeah. wouldn't have told them anything about how to prepare for the star. That that I mean, or direct them to prepare for the right. star. The school district. I, I agree with you, but the school district feels and they direct the blame for their policies to TEA and on that on the preparation matter, right? They feel that the pressure coming from the state, from the, even the legislature, from TEA is so great that this is what they're required to do. And they want to keep their jobs. They want, I mean, and, and this really burned me as, as if I didn't have many reasons to refuse it before, but in, when I first submitted my written refusal and they were trying to tell me that I couldn't my response was, oh yeah, watch me. <laughs> and they, the principal even said to me, because again, accountability is more important than the educating our children. They said, well, you know, Joshua's score is really high on score, on, on assessment scores. They looked at his previous two star assessments since we moved here to Texas. And they said, you know, because he's not white, we really need him to take this assessment and do well. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's ridiculous. It cannot be. Their pressure, yes, is it local policy? Yes, but they feel that their pressure is that pressure is so great coming from the Texas Education Agency, yeah. coming from the legislature, that this is their only recourse. Right. Well, I, I definitely would, um, you know, encourage further discussions at the local school board about the amount of preparation that's required in the district. I'm that parent. They won't even talk to me anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they do have open meetings. So, Ms. Perez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a point of clarification, um, as somebody that currently works in the school district, I don't necessarily think that it's a policy um, a policy issue regarding how much time is spent, but Ms. Davis, you know, my heart breaks for you because you're absolutely right. Um, it's the amount of pressure that the, the school district feels, that administration feels, teachers feel um, they have to. And I think, you know, we, we, like the, crux of this, the crux of this whole argument is always the amount of time that we spend and the pressure that our students are um, are under to test, and that pressure, of course, it, it trickles down into the younger grade levels because they're fear they're fearful for the next grade where they have to test. And so, um, you know, listening to your testimony and, and you're on the verge of tears, it, it, it breaks my heart. I wish that we had more authority to do something, but what I will promise you, um, you know, yesterday during our, our committee on instruction, we heard from two very, three very impassioned parents um, who have the same issue, and 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 
you know, we, we, we want to help. And because of the testimony yesterday, um, we actually had a pretty, um, a pretty interesting conversation regarding, you know, what role we can play as a state board um, in helping to, to sort of guide that conversation as to what accountability should look like. And unfortunately, um, in this commission, I don't know why we were only given one, uh, one role. As a state board of education, I think we need to be primary on that, but you know they don't ask us. So, <laughs> but with the one person that we do have that's going to be representing, um, Representative Beltran, she's she's incredible. She has she has been a teacher, you know she 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 understands, and it's incumbent upon us as elected officials representing uh, the members in our area or representing the constituents in our area that we talk to you all before we bring our suggestions to um, member Beltran who will be talking on that commission. So the voice that she will be, um, that she will have, the voice that she will represent at this commission won't be the voice, won't be our voices, the 15 of us. It should be the voices of parents like yourself who come up and take the time from work, um, take the time from childcare to, to come up and, and share your concerns. So, um, you know, so that's a charge that we all have leaving this, this board meeting today. We need to go back, we need to talk to our parents and we all know how to contact um, how to contact these parent organizations. We need to hear from teachers too because the, the, the concerns that you're having, we hear from educators too. They don't have fun teaching anymore. They, they, their heart breaks for their kids because they feel, you know, it's either their job is on, is on the line or they have to get their, you know, or, or their kids are failing. And so it's, it's a, it's a catch-22 for, for educators as well and administrators feel that pressure. So, um, so, so ultimately what we need to do is go back. Our homework is to go back, talk to the people that we represent, and make sure that when we come back as a body, um, share our concerns and share what we've learned from our constituents with Ms. Beltran when she goes and she speaks on behalf of this board and the people that we represent um, on the commission. So I want to let you know that we will be working on that. And if you need anything from me as well, though I'm not your state board member, I am always happy to help. And I, I'll meet you in the back in just a little bit so we can talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure, did you hear our conversation earlier about that the board is actually going out all over the yes. state um, to gather information just like you're talking about? Um, you know, this is our way of, of actually trying to get the parent information, make sure the commission considers that. So. Um, anyway, I just want to make sure that you, that you knew we were trying to make that effort. Mr. Mercer. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Davis. I know it's a blessing to your child to have an advocate out there. And I've talked to Sarah, Pebble parents, and I'll go down. Mr. Mercer, thank you, but I'm here to say anything. You all can't do anything. And that's probably what you're feeling right now. And, and I'm going to be very honest, and I, and, and I hate that feeling. It's interesting because right now, this is so ironic, right now as we speak, they're trying to reauthorize No Child Left Behind. I know it's a different name. <laughs> in fact, right now as we're speaking, they're trying to, to allow it to be put out there, as we do on this board, out there for 60 days, that anybody, us, board members, citizens, can go look at it. And, you know, my colleague mentioned what I call the big dog, the big fleas, was the federal government and what they require in our, in our high-stakes testing. And that is the problem. It's high-stakes testing. Yes. So, you know, and, and right now I'm hoping that the Congress has the guts to put it out there where parents like you and people like us can go on there and say, hey, this is the problem. And again, people will argue politically, Mr. Mercer, it's not a reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. But I don't see the word stupid in anybody's forehead here. And that, that's my big problem. But it's ironic that this is exactly what's happening right now. And you're frustrated, I'm frustrated too, but I think we need to stop start with the big dog, the federal government, and go on there and let them know how bad this is. I hope you agree with me on that, because I've had many parents tell Mr. Mercer, I'm tired of you telling me you can't do anything. Who can do something? And we're telling you it's the federal government, the state's telling us it's the federal government. We're I'm sorry, we're telling you the state, the state's telling us it's the federal government. Well, the big dog right now is the federal government. And right now as we're talking, they're trying to reauthorize this thing. And it's a time for us as board members, all of us, and the people across the street, and moms and dads, to do. Hopefully they'll authorize it, put it online, that we can see it. It's a couple thousand page document, it sounds yes. familiar, and they want to pass it without reading it. I won't go any further than that one. I'll give you two quick stories. I want you to know teachers, too, are crying. I had a judge that stopped me at a Bedford major district here in San Antonio, and with a teacher who was a science teacher, and he was, she was telling the story that he was saying, well, my son has never got an A in science. And all of a sudden this year, he's got an A in science. I can't believe it. And when I talked to him about it, he can't tell me anything. And the teacher's there talking, said, well, what, you know, and she said, look at my class. There's stacks of the, of the modules to the science experience. Never opened. Because that year, she was told 
a high stakes test is not science. And I met a third or fifth grade teacher, beautiful young lady, maybe 26, 27 years old, in tears, an educator. She told me this is her last year of teaching. Because every Friday she turns in her six classes, times five days, her 30 curriculums of what's taught for the next week. Which is good. I mean, she has to show up front. She's thought, you know, the principal went through and, out and lined out everything. Everything. Social studies is gone. Everything yeah. else. Because that year, whatever the two high say, I believe it's science and math, yeah. for that grade level. And she was in tears and quitting because she couldn't take it anymore. Because I can't teach. You know, I told her not only what to teach, now how to teach. And she couldn't teach, so they were lined out. She showed me the stuff on there because that's not being part of the high stakes testing this year. So you're right on. But the teacher's frustrated too. But uh, you know what? I'm not giving you any help other than telling you I feel the same thing and we need to do something about it. But the answer is high stakes testing and it starts with the federal government. So maybe we can all agree to at least do something about that. Ms. Hardy. Yes, I think the most frustrating thing is that you've had a hard time not getting any answers to your questions, and, and so therefore you end up here with us. And I think Mr. Uh, uh, Rowley from uh, Amarillo explained it as best as any, anyone could possibly do so. I appreciate the fact, though, and I think that several people on this committee have already misunderstood what you're saying. What you're saying is you support the high stakes testing. You don't support the preparation in the way of getting to those high stakes testings. I and support standardized assessments, right? Exactly. As, as, as an assessment of knowledge, I do not support their high stakes testing. Well, I mean, whatever it is, the thing about it is, I support the fact that we should have tests. Because if we don't, I can tell you, there would be a real drop in the amount of, of learning going on. But what you've experienced is spending so much time prepping for a test that they're not really having time to learn. And I can tell you that is duplicated in districts all over the state. What the students should be able to do, and absolutely there's nothing wrong with teaching to the test. We give them the standards, they should teach those standards. You could say that's teaching to the test. That's what we want them to learn. Yeah, that's not teaching to the test, though. <laughs> but that is teaching to the test in educational terms. I have a standard, I want the kids to learn it, I teach to that standard. But what we're doing is when we shut down schools for benchmarks, they don't even know what the word benchmark means, and test and test again, trying to get to that final test is ridiculous and I totally agree with you. I have been frustrated with it from a number of years and it really, we can all kind of pick the dog and everyone blame the next person down. And it is the fact that they put too much emphasis on the test and the uh, students' success on those tests, whether or not they are whatever, uh, and the school's rating is developed around that test. We should put emphasis on learning and then test to see that the student has learned. We have gaps in there. We need to go back and work <coughs> at it again. But I totally agree with you. This idea of spending half of a term prepping for a test and, and not really learning to that information is wrong, and I see it all the time. So. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Bradley. I really appreciate the testimony, but this is turning into a policy discussion rather than just asking a few questions of our test bar. Our test bar. Right. We're not posted to have a discussion. Uh, you know, I will tell you, Ms. Davis, that we are actually, this will be an ongoing agenda item as long as the commission, uh, the commission's report is going to be issued uh, September 1st of next year. And we will have at the state board, every agenda will have uh, a, a posting to uh, have a discussion about assessments and accountability. So uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Randy Hutchins. 